All right, it's been a few months now since the M1 Max came out. It seems like everyone is in agreement that they're the best thing to come out since sliced bread. I mean, since the iPhone. The popular opinion is that you should definitely consider an M1 when shopping for a computer, but does this apply for all cases? I mean, there are some developer workflows where the M1 is kicking some serious butt. Like if you're doing anything with Xcode, and you can check out my videos I've done on that on this channel here. But let's look right now at some situations where the M1 might not be the way to go at all, and maybe some other situations where it might not be the way to go right now. Now, there are a lot of use cases where a computer that's as powerful as the M1 is something that you just don't need and a cheaper computer will suit you just fine. For example, if you're a student looking for a computer for usual tasks such as browsing, taking notes, social media, watching videos, listening to music, you might not need a powerful 16 core computer for that. And the same thing goes for a lot of office work that usually involves document processing. For these cases, you might be fine with a Chromebook and that could cost you less than 500 bucks or a Windows machine that will also be more affordable than the M1 Mac price tag. And if you're a programming student, you might be able to just get away with getting a Linux machine that'll get you through courses and you don't need as much power as the M1 Mac provides. Let me know down below if you're interested in me doing a video on what machines would be good for a student that's just learning how to code. And you might be able to get away with eight gigabytes if you're a COBOL developer, for example. Why does he always pick on COBOL? The 13 inch MacBook Pro or the MacBook Air and the Mac Mini have always been entry level computers. And that's exactly the case for the current iteration of the M1 machines. Yes, of course, they perform better than many processors out there due to their architecture, but I can also understand some reluctance to jump onto the M1 train, especially if you're a power user. The largest limitation to the current M1s is the RAM, which is built in right into the SOC, so you can't really upgrade it. And that might not be the best use for some people, because if you're a developer, Developer, for example, you might need more RAM. Not all developers need more RAM. This is especially useful for folks that have multiple Docker containers running all the time or multiple virtual machines. And when you have those running alongside of an IDE and several browser tabs open, you need that extra RAM. So that's why when you're facing a decision between buying an eight gigabyte model and a 16 gigabyte model, I always say go for the 16 because you will run into that wall. For mobile development, the tools used are usually resource hogs. With 16 gigabyte model, you'll probably be able to have Xcode open in Android Studio plus an iOS simulator and Android emulator, not to mention all the various Stack Overflow browser tabs, <laughs> and you'll still be okay. But if you start adding to the open apps and emulators, you might start running low on RAM. This video, which I'll link down below, it's from a small YouTube creator, so make sure you go show your support. It shows a typical Flutter development setup with a browser, Android Studio, iOS simulator, Android emulator, and terminal all open at the same time. And with that, the RAM used is 12.7 gigabytes. So the RAM can easily go up if you add more emulators to test different device sizes, or if you open other apps like opening another project in Xcode or IntelliJ, or an image editor to edit some icons. So 16 gigabytes is the absolute minimum, but for a future-proof computer, 16 gigabytes of RAM might not even be the best. Well, of course it's not the best, but it might not even be enough for you, depending on what you're doing. At the moment, going pro with the MacBook Pro doesn't really get you that pro performance. I'd say it's better to wait for that next iteration of the machines, which are supposed to have more powerful processors and hopefully more RAM. This current iteration of the M1 MacBook Pro, the 13-inch, doesn't really stick out as significantly better system than the M1 MacBook Air, which is what I've been using. They have almost similar features and benchmarks show similar performance as well. The M1 MacBook Pro feels more like a MacBook Air Pro and Apple is yet to release their high-end Apple Silicon lineup which we sadly missed. There was no announcement at WWWDC this year. WWWDC? All right, you know what I mean. And uh, since there's usually a huge performance gap between their entry level and high end computers, you can be sure that the next MacBook Pros will be packing some serious heat, but also you can be sure that you're gonna be paying quite a bit more for them. For now, if you want a really performant machine, there's still Intel based Macs that will outperform the M1s in certain tasks, not all of them. Again, watch my videos if you want to learn more about that. Or you could just build a custom PC that holds its own against the M1. And many of you in the comments will say, 
Make sure you install Linux instead of Windows on it. All right, we're gonna leave that discussion for another time and expect to pay a good amount for either option though. The other option would be just to wait for the launch of the higher end Macs if you don't have to upgrade as soon as possible, which is what I'm gonna be doing. I'm not transferring my workflow yet to the M1 Mac. I'm waiting for the next one and still using my Intel Core i9 MacBook Pro 16 inch. Now, if you bought a fairly specced out MacBook in 2019, like I did, it would have cost you a pretty penny and I paid almost $4,000 for mine. And a year later, the M1 MacBook comes out and outperforms computers that previously cost $3,000 plus, including my own in certain tasks, again, not all tasks. And right now, the highest spec one costs $2,200. With the next iteration, the same amount might give you something that's immensely better than what's available. And like I mentioned, don't expect the new Macs to be cheaper. The pros will always costs significantly more. But you might find that even the lowest spec one of the bunch might even outperform the high-end M1 or the high spec M1. It's not a bad reward for a few months of patience, don't you think? Don't hold me to that though. I don't know what Apple is doing. Rumors. You can't really believe them. And by the way, there's still software that's either not supported on the M1 Max or that's supported by either buggy or limited features or is being translated on the fly using Rosetta. But this is becoming less of a problem as more developers are adapting their software to the M1s and the new architecture in general. I go over some of the developer tools that aren't natively supported on the M1 chips in the video, which I'll link here somewhere. If you need a Mac as your main work machine, it's best to do some investigation to ensure that all the critical apps that you use are supported. Now, it's not always the best to jump into the first iteration of a new product. They usually have some issues that'll be ironed out later, and this is probably the case with the M1s as well. Now, I haven't personally seen any of these issues, but when they first launched, there were multiple reports of unreliable Bluetooth connection, but this has been addressed with each new macOS update, and the occurrences of these reports have decreased quite a bit. And also at the beginning, there were some reports of crashes, sudden restarts, bricking, but with OS updates, the reports are becoming more and more rare. There was also that SSD gate is what I call it, the SSD fright. Uh, people's SSDs are being burnt out a lot quicker than other machines, that Intel-based machines, and that's a scare that started around February of this year. For those of you that are not familiar, this is essentially where people believe their Macs will have a lifetime of two years max. And I've got a few videos exploring that and explaining why you probably shouldn't worry about that. I do specific tests on Docker with the SSDs and Flutter with SSDs, so check those videos out if you haven't seen them already. And the M1 also has an issue when it comes to using them with ultra wide displays. Now I haven't tried this yet, but I've seen videos on this and it seems like the M1 Mac is yet to support certain display resolutions. And it is a problem that Apple acknowledged and have promised to fix in a future OS update. Apart from that, there are also all sorts of issues when it comes to using the M1s with some external displays from monitors not being detected to displays remaining blank when waking the Mac mini. So if you'd rather not be a guinea pig as Apple tests out its devices with early adopters like this guy, then you can wait for the next iteration of the M1 chips. These will come with better driver support and that'll improve compatibility with peripherals. Now, the M1 MacBook Pro and Air cannot natively connect to more than one monitor. Apple, really? Come on, what's up with that? <laughs> and this is unlike the previous Intel-based MacBooks that supported multiple displays. But there are workarounds to this if you're willing to install third-party drivers, whose support is not guaranteed, by the way, in future macOS updates. And you'd also need to buy some adapters. You can probably find YouTube videos here showing you how to do all that stuff. All right, ports, more ports. We need more ports, right? But Apple actually reduced the number of available ports on its M1 MacBook Pro. This is pretty annoying, especially if you use your MacBook on the go and always have to carry accessories like docks to connect devices and read media. Now it is rumored, again, here's another rumor, that the next MacBook Pros will come with more ports, including an SD card slot, which has been removed and missing from Macs for a number of generations at this point. So we'll see, fingers crossed. If you're into PC gaming, Windows is still your best bet at having a huge selection of games. 
The M1 Max make pretty decent gaming machines, but what's the use of having a fairly powerful gaming rig and not having many games to play? Yeah, you can run PC games on a Mac using virtualization software like Parallels, but that's going to look pretty bad and you'll lose out on performance. If you are into gaming, definitely consider the PC or at least hold off for the next MacBooks, which we'll see if they play games well or not. They're supposed to have even more GPU cores and RAM that games will be able to use. Now, the new Macs may or may not be introduced later on in this year, and if you get an M1 right now, you may or may not regret that decision. I don't regret that decision because I've seen what it can do, and I still think it's a really good entry-level machine. And even if you sell your M1 for an upgrade, the first-generation Macs are going to be more like cars, where you will lose some value from the moment that you buy it and it leaves the shop right? But Macs being Macs will also retain more value than PCs would under the same circumstances. So you got to kind of consider both of those situations. However, with this kind of attitude, you'll always be waiting for the next launch. So at some point you have to make a decision if you need a new machine. So yes, the next MacBooks will be better than the current M1, but that is always the case with technology, isn't it? There's always something new and better on the horizon. You can always be waiting for a better one because then you'll be waiting forever. Yes, the PlayStation 6 will be waiting better than the PlayStation 5, but that doesn't mean you should skip the 5 and wait for the 6. But honestly, at this rate, the PS6 will probably come out before you can even get your hands on the elusive PS5 anyway. Anyway, we're talking about the M1 Max. Should you wait? Personally, if I had a computer that is already serving me well enough at this moment, and if I wasn't a YouTuber looking for months worth of content, <laughs> I would wait. At this point, if you don't already have the M1 and you can still squeeze some productivity from that machine of yours, you've already waited for quite a while since the M1 launch. And if the rumors are true, you only have a few more months to go before the new ones are launched and you'll get a much better deal, even on those same M1s that maybe you can get secondhand from people that are upgrading at that time. And since it's a computer that you'll be using for years, what's a few more months of waiting, huh? But if you need a computer right now and want the performance benefits of the M1 chip, I'm selling mine. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> then you can go ahead and buy one. You won't be disappointed. The M1s are powerful enough to still be at the forefront of computing power for years to come. Hope this video was helpful. I'd appreciate a thumbs up for the YouTube algorithm. Thanks for watching, folks, and I'll see you next time.